All right, good morning, saints. Make sure all my toys are working right. Yeah, okay. So the baptistry, 12 o'clock, I got 55 minutes, right? <laughs> when, uh, when I became a Christian, I, I didn't grow up in any church whatsoever. Uh, so I used to go to various churches of different stripes, and everybody posts when they start. Nobody says when they finish. So I've had to learn through the years. Uh, still learning, by the way. Uh, before I get into my lesson today, I do want to make a comment about our trip to India, uh, which we're hoping to make this next year. Uh, this is a, a part of the work of the church here in Granville. And the reason why I say that is because um, you guys support us. And it's not just financially, you support us uh, spiritually, and you support us uh, with encouragement. And uh, just a quick reminder, because we don't often talk about this, in 2 Corinthians in chapter 9, which was read about when we took up con contribution collection, one of the things that the scripture tells us, Paul tells us here, is that our contribution produces thanksgivings to God. And I'm used to hearing from, from various leaders, you know, like, you guys need to give more, you need to give more. But the reality is we give as, as, we're, as we decide cheerfully, right? But the results, the, the results, thanksgivings to God. And just, just that thought of, of the, the funds that you give as thanksgivings to God. And for, for several years when I started in Oscoda, your contribution, your help, was strictly limited to Oscoda. Well, a couple of years ago, it, it started before COVID, but during COVID, it really kind of took off. Uh, now I do ministry through the internet. I teach in all sorts of countries, actually. Um, I, I teach, of course, in India. Uh, but I, I teach in Pakistan and Bangladesh, and I teach in Kenya, and I teach in Malawi. Uh, and in fact, of course, they live in a completely different time zone. This morning, uh, one of them sent me a message. So be aware of this, that uh, a, a local Christian man in Pakistan, his business was uh, raided by anti-Christian people, and everything in his business was burned. They, they looted his business, they burned it. They, they took all of his product out into the street. He wants to go back. So you, in your giving and your support of the work in Oscoda, are also supporting work that's going on around the world. And you should take heart and be encouraged by that. Great thanksgivings to God are being made. Uh, this morning, I want to get into the lesson. Separate from that, I want to talk about the mystery. And we're going we're gonna to get to the mystery eventually. There's uh, a couple passages that I want to use to set this up properly to make sure that uh, we have the, the right insight into the mystery. So I want to start in the book of Acts in chapter 6, if you'll turn there in your Bibles with me, because uh, I really want you to put your eyes on your Bible, not just the screen up above. So I didn't put the passages up there. I did put uh, some notes up there for you to look at, but you in your Bible, because the more you look at your Bible, the more familiar you are with your Bible. So as you talk with those that are in the church and out of the church, you know where things are, right? I still struggle with that. Uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter 6, now I know the word deacon is not used here, but we'll get into that. In verse 1, now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. I love reading verses like this because it gives me hope. As, as was made mention earlier today about uh, sin, you know, we're really good at sin. We seem to excel at it. 
And that's, you know, something we want to change. We want to get better about not sinning. And it's fascinating to read these verses. The church is just starting here in Acts chapter 6. It, it's just getting its feet under itself, these, these followers, these disciples. And verse 12, or verse 2, and the 12 summon the full number of the disciples. The apostles are there, all, all 12 of them. You've got 12 apostles, you've got the church, and you have widows being neglected by the church with the apostles present. We often take this, this glamorous view of the early church and go, yeah, yeah, those, those guys had it going on. They knew what they were doing. They were, they were real Christians, and, and they are real Christians. And part of being a real Christian is we're going to make mistakes. Part of being a real Christian is knowing that we make mistakes and we're going to work to not make those mistakes. We're going to make some changes. And, and that's very important as Christians that we learn to be better, more like Christ. And so here from the get-go, here in chapter 6, there's already a problem with the Christians. There's these uh, Hellenists. And, and the Hellenists, that, that, that merely means that they spoke Greek instead of Hebrew. And they're in Jerusalem. They're Jews. What are they supposed to be speaking? And the answer is, well, they're supposed to be speaking Hebrew. Yeah, but these guys speak Greek. What are you going to do with that? They speak a different language than the main core group. What are we going to do with that? And the answer is, well, we're going to neglect them. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to make some changes. So verse 2, the 12, the apostles, they, they summoned the full number of the disciples. They got the whole church together, all of us. And they said this, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. This daily distribution, we have a, you know, the Lord teaches us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. And in that day, in that society, the widows, the, the widows, their daily bread was to come from the church. Now, Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he's going to give some, uh, some defining terms for them, for us, about who is a true widow and who isn't. And the church, by the way, is still, because it's in the scriptures, we're supposed to be providing for the widows. We, you and I, us, because we are the church, right? And... Uh, too, too often today, we, we tell people to look to the government. The government's not the church, folks. We are the church. But nonetheless, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. They said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, what's fascinating is the, the word distribution, the daily distribution, that's diakonos. That's the, diakonos is the word for deacon. There's a reason why we're looking at this section here. The word deacon's not used in here, but the word diakonos, the daily distribution is service, the daily service to the widows. And so the, the 12 get together, the, the whole disciples, and they said, it's not right that we should go preaching the word of God to serve tables. And that word serve, that's the word diakonos again. And, and so this service, the the now I don't fault the apostles. We should not fault the apostles. They were eye and ear witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Not just the resurrection, but his whole ministry. These guys are busy. They're serving. They're preaching the word. They're doing their due diligence as Christians, as servants of the Lord. They have their ministry that they're serving, and they say, we don't have time to do this other thing, but there are men in our congregation who can. So, verse 3, therefore, Brethren, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Now that word duty, guess what? It's task. This work that must be done. 
This is something that the church must do. It's not an option. This is who we are as Christians. The apostles sat down and said, we as Christians, we're supposed to be caring for one another. Select seven men that can do this necessary, this needed task. And they, they talk about good repute, full of spiritual wisdom, and I don't want to get too much into that. So verse 4, the apostles, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, that devotion to the prayer. Our leaders need to be devoted to prayer. Our leaders need to spend time in prayer. But then they say the ministry of the word, and that word ministry... That's that word diakonos again. Service. To whom? The word. Preaching and teaching. There's a reason why we call our our preachers ministers because they're serving. How do they serve? And the answer is supposed to be with the word. They're supposed to be teaching us, encouraging us, training us up as Paul will write in the book of Ephesians. That's their responsibility. Now, so that means all the way through this section, while the word deacon isn't used in our English translation, the word deacon is used in our Greek, which is, of course, the original language it was written in. These are the first deacons. And it's interesting to note that they were assigned, they were appointed for a specific duty, a necessary task. What was that? The daily service, the daily diakonos of caring for the widows. This is the deacons. Now, this lesson isn't solely about deacons. They're part of this. But like I said, we got to piece a couple pieces together. So turn with me now to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We've been through these verses, hopefully, if you've ever been part of a, a deacon selection or an elder selection, hopefully you've looked at these verses and others. There's a lot of other verses to look at, but these should be very familiar with you. And I'm not going to break down each one of these, but I want to get to one phrase that Paul uses here in 1 Timothy. And I used to wonder... And honestly, all of the times that I've been a part of a a deacon selection process, and I am one, all the times that I've been a part of the deacon selection process, no one's ever talked about this part. We talk about all the things around it, but not this part. What is this part? Let's read. Verse 8. Deacons, there's that same word, servants, likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Everybody debates verse 8. It talks about the various aspects of verse 8. They talk about verse 10. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, it goes on in verse 11. We almost always skip verse 9. Why is that? Is there something offensive with verse 9? No, it's not offensive, but it really is something where we're not used to thinking about what Paul writes here. And that's what I'm presenting to you today. The mystery of the faith. Our deacons have a responsibility to hold, he says, the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. What is a clear conscience? I've always done the right thing concerning this matter. Whatever this matter is, I have a clear conscience about it. I've never done wrong about this matter. What is, what is this matter that Paul brings out here in verse 9? And the answer, of course, is holding the mystery of the faith. So that begs the question, of course, Oh, I'm behind on my slides. What in the world is this mystery of the faith? What is Paul talking about here? And this is where I really want to get to. This is, this is the point of the lesson. Uh, and so turn with me to the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 1, Paul writes this, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of other men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
Now we're going to go back and look at chapter 2 as soon as we finish breaking this section down. But the reality is this. When we go to Acts chapter 6, what we see is exclusion. Various Christians are excluded because they speak a different language. And what we saw when Paul wrote to Timothy about deacons is our deacons are supposed to hold to the mystery of the faith. Well, what's the mystery of the faith? Paul tells us here in Ephesians chapter 3. What is that mystery? Gentiles are fellow heirs. Well, that doesn't mean much to you and I because most of us are Gentiles, aren't we? We take it for granted. Who, who here struggled with the concept of reading about the, the, the second covenant, the new covenant that's given by the prophet Jeremiah about how this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah after those days? Who sat back and said, well, I'm not of the house of Israel. I'm not of the house of Judah. How do I get into this second covenant? How do I become a part of that? None of us ever struggle with that because we don't talk about the new covenant. We don't talk about how God says this is with Israel and this is with Judah. We all turn around we go if you want Christ you need to believe repent and be immersed into Christ and be faithful and that's correct that's accurate but we're not Israel and we're not Judah so how do we get in how do we get to be a part of this new covenant new covenant in my blood Jesus says uh, pertaining to the Lord's Supper we partake of that every week this new covenant we're in it. But how? But why? And, and this is the answer. And, and you and I, we need to know this answer. And, and the, the, the struggle for us is not just knowing the answer. We know the answer. But the other part is application. What is the application? And, and thinking back to Acts chapter 6... What language do we need to speak in order to be a Christian? And the answer is, it doesn't matter, does it? What, what race do we need to be to be a Christian? Some would say, well, you need to be of Israel or of Judah. But the reality is, we Gentiles, and Gentiles merely means non-Jew, we Gentiles are included as well. And we could look at Cornelius in the book of Acts and other places. See, we automatically assume that we can be a part of this new covenant. And it's true, we can. But because we can means everybody can. See, those deacons, they're supposed to hold to the mystery of the faith. What's the mystery? The mystery is Jew and Gentile alike are saved together. And so as a deacon, as a servant, as a minister serving the Christians, what are they supposed to do? And the answer, hold to that mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, meaning those deacons cannot ever exclude somebody because they're of a different nationality, a different race, a different language, a different economic value, a different education, a different fill-in-the-blank, a different anything. Now, if that's the standard for deacons, what about the rest of us? See, Paul here, he's writing to all of us here in Ephesians. You may think, yeah, yeah, I'm not a deacon. I don't have to do those things. Paul here is writing to all of us in Ephesians 3. And so he says in verse, verse 1, for this reason, I don't, I don't have time to get into the this. Back up and read chapter 2, right? For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. You would think he would say a prisoner of Rome, but he's not a prisoner of Rome. He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Jesus imprisons Paul. For what purpose? On behalf of you Gentiles. Paul's in prison so that he will fulfill his administration, his duty, his stewardship of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul's in prison so that he will write his prison epistles, including this one. He has a responsibility. Just think about that. If, if Paul was able to go about his ministry freely, uninhibited, preaching and proclaiming the good news, I wonder how many of our New Testament epistles would we actually have? Think about, for example, the, the preacher Apollos, a great preacher, a rhetorician. 
what were his words? What did he have to say? And the answer is, we don't know. He didn't write anything for us. But Paul did. And this is one of those things that he writes for us, for you and I, so that we would be aware of these things. And, and as we read this section, remember, it's not just all about me, as we learned about in our Bible class this morning. It's about others as well, right? For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, Paul's a Jew, he's, behind, he's in prison for us. Verse 2, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, God gave Paul a duty, a responsibility, a stewardship, an administration. And his job was to take God's grace and share it with the Gentiles. Did he do that? Of course he did. Over and over again, not only do you read it in the book of Acts, but you read it throughout his letters, including this letter, the grace of God. What's the grace of God? And some of you uh, who've been Christians for, for a while may say unmerited favor, and that's true. But what does that mean? A gift that we don't deserve. That's God's grace. And especially for us as Gentiles, as non-Jews, God's grace really is grace. Because we don't have anything that should make God say, Scott, I want to save you. This is all about God and his grace. And so Paul, speaking of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to him for us, us Gentiles. Verse 3, the mystery was made known to Paul by revelation. God told Paul. And, and again, this is very significant because Paul is not part of the original 12 apostles. And, and you read the book of Galatians and Paul will make it clear that he went to Jerusalem and they compared their gospel and what they found is they preach the same thing. They preach the same thing. There's, there's no difference between those two. This revelation that Paul was given, the apostles had it as well. And he's written briefly about it. Now that word briefly, I know I'm talking a lot this morning. Briefly means Paul could have written a whole lot more about it. What he writes here is cliff notes. He's laying out just the barest parts that we need to know. And we're going to spend the rest of our lives learning about this mystery. And as I converse with and work with people of other nationalities, other languages, and other societies, I am learning a whole lot about humanity. And I'm learning about people who love God and people who love Jesus. And I love being able to open the scriptures with them and talk with them. This mystery of anybody, this mystery of everybody being able to be saved. This mystery, verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. This is the beautiful thing about Christ. We can read about Jesus in our Old Testament. We can study about him in our Old Testament. But the reality is that when you go back and read the Old Testament, while it talks about Christ, how are the Gentiles going to be saved? How are the non-Jews going to be brought into the kingdom of God? God had already established his kingdom. You can go back and figure that out. Saints of old, and talk about Abraham and David and others. Uh, we, we read our New Testament, and we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all right here. Imagine throwing away all of your New Testament, reading only your Old Testament, and trying to figure out Christ. It's, it is a tough job. And there's a reason why the scholars and the experts failed at it. Because they brought their own preconceived ideas, their own selfishness into the reading of the text. It's hard to get out of that mold. It's hard to step back from it and just read the scriptures as God has made them known to us. That's a challenge. It really is. Sons of men in other generations, they didn't know it. It's been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now we read our New Testament 
And we get something that those who believed in God before us didn't get to know. We get to know the answers to the mystery. It's all revealed to us. We, we've, we flip to the back of the book, and sometimes we haven't bothered to read the introduction. Sometimes we haven't bothered to, build, to learn about the character building that brings up the solution to the mystery. I'm thinking of when you read, for example, a mystery novel, as we call them in our society, you know, the murder mysteries, who did it and how they did it and why they did it, and you get to the end of the book. Have you ever thought about sometime just picking up a brand new murder mystery, reading the last couple chapters? We do that with our Christianity sometimes, and we shouldn't. We need to know the whole story. We need to be able to, to read from the beginning and understand just how precious this grace of God that's extended to you and I and then turn around and share it with those who don't know about it. Amen. This mystery, verse 6, is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. We inherit the same thing as the saints of old. I don't want to say just the Jews because, for example, Abraham, he was a man of faith. He is the father of righteousness. He was never a Jew. He was never under the law of Moses. We share the same inheritance that was given to Abraham. That hope of heaven, eternal life, salvation, all of those words and phrases that we use in our New Testament, those were all known to Abraham. He knew about those things, such things. He even knew about the resurrection of the dead. We are fellow heirs with him and with others like him. Fellow heirs, members of the same body, one body. We talk about Jesus built the one church, which it, there is one church through his, through his sacrifice, the one body, the, that's the church. But the body, the body in the kingdom, again, Abraham, saints of old, the one body. And as Paul continues, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. What promises are those? I don't have time to get into all of those today, but have you ever thought about it? These are the things that God has promised us. And, and we, with Christ, as Christians, the hope of expectation, because we know that God cannot lie. The things that God says will come to pass, will come to pass. The promises that he's given to us in Christ Jesus that come through the gospel. The good news. What good news? Salvation, freedom from sin, death, and hell. All of these things are tied up in this, in this brief little paragraph. As Paul says, I have written briefly. I love that idea because we can spend the rest of our lives parsing out all these different parts. And of course, I want to jump over to, uh, back to second, uh, Ephesians 2. I want to say 2 Corinthians. No, Ephesians 2 with me. Because he's going he's gonna to write more about this back in Ephesians chapter 2. Chapter 3 is the summarization. So back up to chapter 2 because now chapter 2 is going to mean more for us, for you and I. Chapter 2, verse 11, he's going to write about where we were and what we are. Verse 11, he says, therefore. And what's a therefore? Therefore, that's a conclusion based on what he wrote before. Don't have time to get into all of that. Go back and read it on your own. But he says, therefore, remember... Don't forget this, Christians. Do not forget this. He's going to say twice, verse 11 and verse 12. Remember. Remember what? Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. What time? Go back and read the beginning of the chapter. You were dead in your sins. You were separated from Christ. Do you know what it means to be with Christ today, in Christ today? Do you remember what it was like before? 
Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And, well, we'll get to the strangers. We don't use the word commonwealth in our English language today. Alienated from the nationality of Israel. You were, we were not Jews. Wow, that's all right. I've read the Old Testament. I don't want to be a Jew. We weren't Jews, which meant we didn't have a relationship with God. We didn't have worship with God. We didn't have blessings from God. We didn't have God watching over us. We didn't have God providing for us. Being, not, not being a Jew has its definite detractions. We lived in sin. We were in the kingdom of darkness. The things that we did, we are ashamed of now. And they brought about death. That's where we were. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers to the covenants of promise. We had no idea what God promises. Before we became a Christian, before we heard the word of Christ, before we heard about Jesus, we had no idea who God was or is, and we had no idea what he could or would do for us. We're bumbling about in our own little way trying to live our lives. I didn't grow up in the church. And sometimes I'm a little jealous of people who did because they got to experience so many wonderful and great and precious things that I never did as a child. Having parents who would know the scriptures, who would teach them to me and raise me up in them. Being able to go to Bible camp and enjoy time with other fellow Christians that are my age. But not growing up in the church enables me to see what it's like to not know anything about Christ to not know anything about God and to realize just how desperate, how terribly we live our lives before we become Christians. Paul here, as he writes, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. There's a lot of people, especially today in our society, who live without hope. And they'll, they'll tell you, I don't believe that there's a God. I don't, I don't trust the scriptures. I, you guys are living in a, a backward old religion. You just need to move forward and learn what science has shown us. God is more than just what this book reveals to people without study. How do you fit an eternal God into this little book? How do you, how do you fit who God is into the, the writings of men almost 2,000 years ago? who are limited in scope and knowledge about some of the things of science? And the answer is, you can't. Now, Scripture is very plain to us. God has revealed to us everything we need for life and godliness. But when I read this book, as an example, I don't read anything about penguins. Not directly. It talks about birds, but there's no penguins in here. Very disappointed, God. That's an unreal expectation. What has God given to us? He's given us instructions on how to live. He's given us instructions on how to love. He's given us instructions on how to love Him and one another if we would pay attention. See, this, this lesson about the mystery of Christ, this lesson is about loving God and loving one another because when we start to love God, that means we automatically love one another. You can read that in 1 John. But what does that look like? 
in our society struggling just with the word love right now. They have no idea because they can't read the scriptures. They're without hope and they're without God. And we, you and I, now that we're Christians, we get to walk with God. We get to know what hope is. Hope is that unrealized expectation of future promises. You know what the opposite of hope is? The opposite of hope is fear. Think about what fear is. And most people, for, just for an example, they would think, well, I'm afraid of spiders or I'm afraid of snakes. No, you're not afraid of spiders and snakes. You're afraid of what they can do to you. Again, just as an example, if you think about a spider, you know, the spider by itself could live in your house and you'd never know about it, and then you see it, and now you're afraid. He's been there for years. Why? What's changed? Well, I'm afraid he may bite me. Yes, may bite me, right? This, this is the struggle that we're having as Christians, remembering this is where we were. Remember these things. Don't forget these things. Ah. Uh, but now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus. This is where we are, in Christ Jesus. You who once were far off have been brought near, not of our undoing, but by the blood of Christ. Jesus on the cross. Jesus has brought us near to God. We were alienated. We were separated. We were strangers. Now we have all of that. By the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace. He himself is the one who has made us both one. Who's the both? Answer, Jew and Gentile. You know, what's strange is as Paul writes this to the Ephesian church, it's Jew and Gentile. It's not, it's not denomination, 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 denomination. It is Jew and Gentile brought together. There's one church, and he'll write that later. He's already written that in chapter 1. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus went to the cross to get rid of the hostility between Jew and Gentile, and it boggles my mind when I start to talk to people who are busy dividing the body of Christ today. Jesus died so that we could be one. Just think about the different worship between a Jew and a pagan back in that day. And Jesus comes along and says, you can both be one in Christ Jesus. And here we are, almost 2,000 years later. And what are we doing? I'm going to go over here and worship God, and, and I'm going to go over here and worship God, and I'm going to go over here and worship God, and, and we divide about our different types of worship, and we divide about our different types of language, and we divide about our different types of nationalities, and one in Christ. He has made us both one, broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. What did he do? Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man. We are one new man in Christ. This is what Jesus has done for us. He has made us one. One new man in place of the two, so making peace. Peace between the Jew and the Gentile. And again, just think about the worship of pagans. Plop them down in the middle of a worship of a Jew. They could do it. Are we any less? Verse 16, might reconcile us. Bring us both together to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that's us Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, that's the Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, verse 19, conclusion. You, Gentiles, you and I, 
You're no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. What are you? You are fellow citizens with the saints. That's not just the Jews. Again, that goes back to Abraham, the father of righteousness, saints of old, right? You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We belong. We are invited in through the blood of Christ. We are supposed to be here. God wants us here. No longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is God at work among us. And it's not, it's not me. It's not you. It is us. And it is God working through us that these things happen. I, I, I forgot to push my button. My apologies. How do we know what we're supposed to do? How do we know that we can be Christians? How do we know what it is to be Christ-like? How do we know to worship God? And the answer is what they wrote for us. The apostles and prophets wrote them down. Apostles such as Paul, apostles such as Matthew, apostles such as John, prophets like Mark, prophets like Luke, prophets like Jude. They wrote these things down for us. So we know as members of the household of God how we ought to behave because we belong. Who's the we? Jew and everybody else. We all belong in this one body. The whole structure, verse 21, joined together, grows into a holy temple. Think about who we are. We're used to thinking of temples as this big, magnificent structure that reaches to the heavens and it's got impressive artwork and, and impressive cornices and an impressive we, you and I, are that impressiveness in this world in the one body. Because as we grow, verse 22, we are being built. We're growing up, built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God with us. This is the mystery of the faith. This is a struggle that Christians have had going back to Acts chapter 6. Are we any different? And the answer is sometimes, if we learn. But we need to remember these things. Remember, Paul says. Remember where you were before Christ. Know the promises that God has given you now. And know that we, all of us, are being built into this dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the mystery that we all should take hold of and all should hold fast to and all should know and reveal to the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world, they can be Christians too. They are welcome to be in a part of the household of God through Christ, through his gift. I've got a song up here. <laughs> this morning, let me encourage you. If you've known about the mystery, that's awesome, that's great. Make sure you teach it to others. If you've known about the mystery, you need to remember the mystery always. If you've never heard the mystery, I hope this morning's been encouraging for you, that it's been helpful to you, and that you walk closer with God. If you are not a part of the mystery yet, meaning you've not given yourself to Christ, you're not in Christ, that mystery is part for you. You can be saved this morning as well. You can be a Christian. You need to follow Jesus, take him as Lord and Christ, Master, King, and Savior, Messiah. But he died for you. He went to the cross for you, and that, that can be yours. You can be free from sin, free from death, free from hell through Christ Jesus. That can be yours, being immersed into Christ this morning. And I would encourage you to grab hold of that mystery of the faith 
and hold on to those promises that God gives us of eternal life. Those can be yours this morning if you need them, but you've got to come forward and let us know as we stand and sing.